What are you doing? Well, you know, I was thinking of moving the couch over here. Well, why would you want to do that? <laughs> so that there would be a decent place for me to sit. Rach, there is a decent place. And your lap does not count. <laughs> okay, come on, help me move this. No, no, no. No? No. Rosita does not move. I'm sorry, Rosita? As in? As in Rosita does not move. Joey, it's just a chair. What's the big deal? The big deal is that it is the exact equal distance from the bathroom to the kitchen, and it's at the perfect angle so you don't get any glare coming off of Stevie. Stevie the TV? Is there a problem? No. <laughs> oh, what does he know? Come on, Rosita. Us chicas got to stick together. <laughs> Now, if anybody asks, your name is Rosita. in her prime. Joey, the new chair will be here in an hour. Maybe we should actually move Rosita out of here, you know? Start the healing process. Yeah, I guess you're right. She's healed. That's weird. No, it's not weird. It's a miracle. It's not a miracle, Joey. I'm sure there's some explanation. Oh, there is. If you want something enough and your heart is pure wonders, things can happen. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hope. My name is Ashley Lentz. I'm one of the pastors. I just love that clip from Friends. That's my favorite TV show. And Joey believes that his lazy boy recliner is healed. And it is a total miracle. He loves that chair so much. And we start a new sermon series in the month of April coming off of Easter. It's about hope stories. It's people's stories about God showing up and showing off in their life. And as we begin this series, the hope story this week is about healing. It's about miracles. It's about the power of God's presence and how we encounter him through prayer. And so throughout the month of April, you will be hearing stories from faces in our congregation about the way that God is working in their life. And four weeks is not enough time to tell you all of the hope stories, if you will, of the things that God is doing around here. And so I hope that we can post on social media kind of consistently some hope stories. We've been writing uh, these stories down and collecting them, and you continue to share them with us. We're noticing that God is always at work. That shouldn't be surprising. And it's amazing to hear your stories as they continue uh, to be brought to us. And you share how God is working in your life, and it's pretty cool. And so again, uh, we start with healing and the power of God to work in and through our lives. And so Friends helps us on a lighthearted note because pretty quickly this becomes very serious. We have really big, sometimes hard questions around healing, around prayer, around miracles. Questions like, does God heal today? Are there still miracles? What's the point of prayer if we don't see answers? Why would I keep praying for something that God doesn't seem to be answering. And so we'll dive into all of these things today, but real briefly, does God heal today? Yes, all the time God heals. And his promise is that we're all healed. We'll get to that in a minute. Are there still miracles? Yes, all the time. And we see them around here. Miracles are happening all the time around us. What's the point of prayer if we don't see answers? We'll dive into that here in just a little bit too. But I want to introduce you to uh, our Hope story this week. Her name is Kenzie Julik. Kenzie and her family have been around Hope 
a long time, and she's had a very long journey when it comes to healing and prayer and sickness and, and walking through some real trials and suffering. So I met Kenzie through Alpha this winter. I'd seen her family around for a long time, but her and I really started chatting at Alpha, and so I will let her introduce herself. Here's Kenzie. I have been coming to Hope Me and My Family for about 12 years now. Um, my husband and I have been together since high school, and we moved down here uh, about 2006, tried out a few different church homes throughout the years, never really found anything that fit, and got to talking with some of our friends, and they let us know about their experience at Hope, so we decided to try it out, and after that first service, um, we just knew it was home. Okay, tell me about your family. So um, my husband, Mike, was full-time military for, well, I guess he, um, He's now a vet, but 20 years mm -hmm. military. Um, he was a recruiter. We decided we wanted to move down to this area because our, our oldest daughter was getting ready to start kindergarten. And we were like, do we want to stay in our hometown forever? Do we want to move? So we decided to make the move. And it was literally on a whim. Just one morning woke <laughs> up, said, you want to go look at houses in Ankeny? And that's what we did. Talk to me about how you started getting plugged in, because you've been around a long time, so yeah. talk to me about that journey. Um, a, a lot of my stuff came with helping with, um, you know, kind of BBS. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of where I was. I ha I'm in real estate, so I can have a flexible schedule, and so I started doing BBS since Julian was little. Um, you know, Sydney and Devin helped out too, and then we would help down in, um, you know, Sunday before before church, we'd help with the kids as well. Yeah. So now that Julian's older, I'm I'm not quite as involved anymore. But Mike is leading his um, his Power Life group. So yes. and then Devin helps him as well with that. So yeah. really really cool. So sweet. And you guys just finished Alpha. Yep. Talk about that experience. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> we had tried it out um, another time before, but mm -hmm. just timing just didn't work. And so this one was a Tuesday night and. We just realized this is perfect. Kenzie and her family had been around Ankeny for a while. They were simply invited, and then they got plugged in. I wonder if you can relate to that. You were simply invited, and now you're like, what do I do next? Well, let me tell you, Vacation Bible School, she talks about that, is coming up. All summer, we start getting excited about VBS. So you can mark that on your calendars. It'll be uh, the last two weeks of July. And also, she and Mike just finished Alpha. Alpha is a nine-week course where we dive into questions like, who is Jesus? What's up with the Bible? How do I read it? Uh, does God still heal today? How do I pray? Who's the Holy Spirit? Those kind of things. And so we will have Alpha again beginning in September. And so just, just know there's a lot of ways for you to get plugged in around here. Those aren't the only ones, but those are the ones that she talks about. And they're really good ways to get involved in this community. And we'll pick up her story here in just a little bit. But before we do that, I want to revisit John's gospel, what you heard in our scripture reading. And so if you have your Bibles, you can open with me. John chapter 5, uh, Jesus heals this man who is by the pool of Bethesda. And I don't know about you, but when I open scripture, I expect to encounter God. And especially in the gospels, when I'm reading about the life and ministry of Jesus, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I expect to see miracles. I know that Jesus can cast out demons. I know that he's going to make blind people see. I know that this sick man is going to get healed, that he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. I have an expectation that I'm going to encounter him there. And in that way, and this week, as I was really diving into John's gospel, I thought, Ashley, why don't you wake up with an expectation that you're going to encounter Jesus like that today? Why is that only a thing that we feel? I wonder how many of you can relate to that. I wonder why we don't feel that way every single day. If we feel that way when we're opening scripture, why don't we feel that way when we step into every single day of our life? Like, I'm going to encounter Jesus today. I might see some healing power some Holy Spirit stuff going on. We should absolutely walk into every single day with the expectation that Holy Spirit's gonna show up and show off just like Jesus was doing in these stories that we read in the Gospels. That's how alive and active he is in our world today. Please don't dismiss that. And so I wanna revisit this story and maybe read it with a slightly new lens. This is John chapter five. I'm gonna begin in verse one. You've heard it read, so you can follow along or just listen again. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. 
Inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? Often when I've read this story or heard it taught, uh, we focus on Jesus' question because it's weird. Is it, Jesus knows the answer, right? He, this guy is laying next to a pool. John tells us that Jesus knows he's been sick for a long time. Why would Jesus ask him if he wants to get well? And that's a valid question to ask. But what struck me was the circumstances around this story. Let's put ourselves in the story for a minute. I cannot fathom being sick for 38 years. That's longer than I've been alive. That's a really long time. I don't know what it's like to be sick that long. And this man has been sick lying by this pool so close to this water that's going to heal him for a long time, surrounded by crowds of people there. And if someone asks you via your circumstances, they know you've been sick a long time, do you want to get well? Don't you go, duh, that's why I'm sitting by the pool. I've been here a while. Of course I want to get well. Aren't you very passionate about that healing? That's not this guy's response to Jesus. He says to Jesus, I can't, sir, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. His response is so practical. It's like he has no expectation of being healed. I can't, sir, for I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. What struck me as I read this was his lack of community. There's no one to put me in the pool. No one cares about me deep enough to just get me in the water when it bubbles up. Did you hear where John says that there are crowds of people at this pool? He's not actually alone by the pool, but he certainly feels that way. And I don't know if he's been by the pool for 38 years or not, but he's been there a while. And he still can't get well because he lacks the people to help him get that healing. And then he has an observation. Someone else always gets there ahead, gets there ahead of me. It seems like the healing is always for someone else, just not quite for me. I'm feet, maybe, from healing, and it's just, just not coming. This man also has no idea that he's talking to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He can't possibly know that. He's standing in the presence of God and doesn't know. What Jesus says to him is, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. This guy doesn't say, that's weird. He was instantly healed. He rolled up his mat and began walking. That's the power of Jesus' presence. This, This man didn't even know it. Until Jesus said, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. It was at our Easter services where Pastor Scott preached on being in the presence of Jesus. Mary, as uh, she is going to leave the empty tomb, she actually encounters Jesus, but she doesn't recognize him. You can go back and listen uh, to his message or watch our full Easter service on YouTube or uh, on the podcast. Mary doesn't recognize Jesus as she's standing in his presence. And what Pastor Scott said was on Easter morning, he said, I'm afraid that you're in the presence of God and you're missing it. Don't miss being in the presence of Jesus. Church, if you're sitting by a pool or you have loved ones who are like right there close to healing or want healing or praying for healing and you're simply lacking community, I want you to know you have that here. Please don't come. Come in and come out and think that the presence of God didn't encounter you that you don't have the people who are going to help you find healing and restoration and life because that's a lie. You do. It's right here. Everybody look around you. Do it so that the people around you actually get uncomfortable, okay? Really do it. Look around. Look around. You are in the presence of God. Holy Spirit dwells here. He dwells in you every single day. Please don't dismiss that power. I don't want you to come in and think that it's not for you. It is for you. This community is for you. We'll get to the, somebody else always seems to get healed instead of me. We'll get to that in just a little bit. But I want you to know you are not alone in whatever journey it is you are facing. And the best news is as we come off of Easter, 
that's the promise of the resurrection, that Holy Spirit power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. That's what Paul writes in Romans chapter eight. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. That means there is no thing of this world that's not gonna raise you from the dead too. Didn't we just sing Ain't No Grave? Was that not super fun? Oh, it's so good. Yeah, we, yes. Let's give God praise for our amazing worship team. Yes, there's no grave that's gonna hold you down because the spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. I want you to know that this morning. I want you to feel that in this place that God is for you, he is with you, he wants to encounter you. And so we jump back to Kenzie's story and we say, she's been on a really long journey when it comes to sickness and healing. And so I asked her to kind of discuss that for us and how God has been showing up in that for her. And I think you'll hear how community has played a role. Take a look. Talk to me about your your journey through healing, experiencing God's presence, you've had a very long journey when it comes to illnesses and getting better. And just, it's amazing to see God show up (laughs) in that. And so I'm just going to give you the floor to talk about, uh, just give us, give us a rundown of God showing up in your life, uh, through the power of healing and his presence. Yeah. I think if I, if I could start way back, uh, just in my teenage years, I had just random illnesses that would pop up and, um, you know, I had a month or a month, excuse me, I had a week long um, hospital stay that ended up with no answers. Um, you know, high school, my senior year, missed a lot of school and still really had no answers, went on into college and then had a few years where everything was good. Um, got pregnant with Devin, our middle, and they found, um, you know, a growth on my thyroid when he was five, five weeks old. So then I immediately had to go into a surgery for that Mm -hmm. few more years. And this all happened. I'm recalling, (laughs) so we've chatted before Yeah. (laughs) and this all happened when Mike was not home. Yeah. Yeah. So So, your community was church. Yep. Yeah. So 2014 is where that really started. Mike was traveling for work. He um, was also traveling for the military all at the same time. So Mm -hmm. it was almost a 30 day time stint that he wasn't home and I was having tongue pain and (laughs) right. Yeah. And so I called my doctor who my doctor's always been a huge advocate. He knows that I just kind of have that little special power that if something's not right, I know it. So Mm -hmm. I went in to see him and he's looking at me like your tongue hurts. And I'm like, yeah, my tongue hurts. sounds weird, but this is not normal. So he's like, uh, okay, well let's do some labs, you know? So Mm -hmm. we did labs and, um, over the next several weeks, I mean, it just wasn't getting better. I wasn't feeling better. I was now sleeping 18 to 20 hours a day. This whole time, Mike's gone. Um, and you have a toddler and a five-week-old. Or, I have a toddler, sorry. Yeah. I have a toddler, and then Devin and Sydney were older at this time. Okay, so, yeah. okay, yes. So kind of my thyroid journey started when Devin was a baby, and I think it's just kind of snowballed into all of this extra yeah. stuff. Okay. So, so at this time, Juju's probably two years old. And then Sid and Devin are in, you know, middle school. Yep. And um, from then, my doctor's just, you know, hey, let's come in, let's do blood work. And he'd call and check on me every couple days. Um, and I'm still not better. You know, 18 yes. to 20 hours of sleeping. We don't have family really around here. My yeah. mom's an hour and a half away. My sister's three hours. So um, it just, it, it was just something I had to deal with. Life and was really hard. It Life was. was really hard. It was. Yep. I, I had a couple good friends that would help us out, but yep. otherwise I didn't put a lot out there because I'm in a public job. I didn't want people to think that I couldn't perform. Sure. So um, I, I stayed silent mm-hmm. for a lot of it. And mm-hmm. then after about five weeks of dealing with it silently, the symptoms started packing on. Brought me back down to the room, said, hey, we're going to draw more blood. And I mean, I'm not kidding. That at one time we drew 24 vials of blood. Um, and things were just being sent to Mayo Clinic because they it, couldn't figure they it no out. They had no idea what was going on. Yeah, and at that time we had sent so much to Mayo Clinic and they um, landed on sarcoidosis or histoplasmosis, which are both kind of lung diseases, um, very common in the Midwest, but a lot of people don't have, you know, their symptoms don't flare up. Mm-hmm. And then he told me lymphoma as well. So I'm sitting in that doctor's appointment by myself Mm -hmm. (laughs) because my husband's gone traveling and 
I'm just sitting here thinking, hey, it's just going to be another, another appointment. I've done these every week for the last five weeks. And so it was in that moment that I broke down. Talk to me about experiencing Jesus presence. Yes. Yeah, so I decided to compose all my thoughts and actually put it out <laughs> on Facebook that night. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wrote it. It took me a long time to write. And then, you know, you sit there and I, I put private there. I'm like, am I ready to put this out there? I'm not sure. And then the next mm -hmm. morning I woke up and I said, you know what? I am ready. So I changed the, the posts that I had written from private to public mm -hmm. and within minutes, I was getting, you know, messages, uh, words of encouragement from people, private messages. I mean, just my phone was literally blowing up with hundreds of people sending support, which yeah. was absolutely amazing. Yes. You know, it, it's like, and from that point forward, it was almost like an instant calm. Mm. It, it was, you know, I went from being scared to calm scared, yeah. you know, like knowing that I had people there in my corner. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think I've lived my whole life with, you know, my husband's in the military. He's been to war. We've, we've gone through times and, you know, being strong is something that, you know, we think we have to do. And so I think right. silently suffering for those five weeks through this by myself and not saying anything, it was just a, a form of me trying to be strong yes. when I really, I, I needed support of people. It was in the five weeks where she was really struggling and totally silent where symptoms after symptoms just started packing on. Uh, she was sleeping 18 to 20 hours a day, couldn't function, was home alone. And it's when she reached out to people, <clears throat> when she asked for prayers, when she leaned on her church community that things started to get better. Quick spoiler alert, Kenzie isn't completely healed. She has a lung disease that she will live with for the rest of her life that gets worse at times and, and better at others but she knows she has community that's going to support her in all of that. So again, I just want you to hear you're part of a community where the presence of God dwells and you don't need to walk through the hard things alone. God's with you in all of those things. And so we circle back to the question, so what about the people who aren't healed? What about those of us who are walking alongside our loved ones who are still struggling with really hard things? Or maybe that's your story. You're struggling with a really hard thing. Where's God in that? Well, he promises to be present in that. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead still lives in you. And he's actually always answering our prayers. And we talk about this at Alpha. And I don't know if it's a good answer, but I think it's the right answer. God sometimes answers our prayers with yes. God sometimes answers our prayers with no. God sometimes answers our prayers with not yet. And sometimes God answers our prayers with heaven. So when we ask, I want the miracle. I want healing. I want to see it. Certainly we all want to see that on this side of heaven. We want to see that for our loved ones on earth. We want to see that for ourselves on earth. And I know the promise of God is that we absolutely will see that healing. Sometimes we do see it on this side of heaven. Make no mistake about it. There are a ton of miracle stories around this church. People who walk in and say, I have cancer, we pray for them, and they don't have cancer. There are people who walk in and say, I'm supposed to get this surgery, and I really don't want to have surgery. Could you pray for this thing? We pray for it. They go for uh, pre-op scans and appointments, and their doctor goes, you don't need surgery anymore. And they said, yeah, my church prayed for me. They're not surprised. Doctors are surprised. Miracles like this happen all the time. And again, we'll share those with you. Four weeks isn't enough to cover all the amazing things that God is up to. So we'll put these on social media for you to see because they're awesome. But what I love about Kenzie's story is that I think it's so relatable. I think so many of us can say, man, that feels like a journey that me or my family has been on. So where is God in that? And sometimes that healing, that full restoration, it comes in heaven and that's a promise. That's a really good thing. I know it sounds like a bummer because as loved ones walking alongside people who are going to potentially leave this earth, we don't want that. We don't ever want our loved ones to leave. And they get to be fully healed and restored. That's the power of the resurrection, church. That God's heart for you is always restoration and healing and resurrection and life. That's how powerful he is, that there is no grave that's going to hold his body down. My favorite part of that song 
is if he walked out of the grave, I'm walking too. Can we all say that together? If he walked out of the grave, I'm walking too. One more time. If he walked out of the grave, I'm walking too. I hope that as you say that, you're not just saying it because I asked you to say it. That as you walk out of here, that that's a reality of your life. You know that for you and for your loved ones, they don't actually die. If he walked out of the grave, we get to go too because God's heart for us is perfect healing and restoration and life. Sometimes that looks like the physical healing and that's amazing and we see miracles like that. Sometimes it looks like being surrounded by community and experiencing God's presence in and through the trials and suffering. Kenzie talks about that calm. She said, I was still scared, but it was a calm scared. God shows up in the midst of our trials and suffering to transform us, to bring us into deeper relationship with him. And that in itself is a form of healing. It's a form of life in the face of death. And that is God's heart for you. That you know his power and his presence. Uh, One last clip from Kenzie as she wraps up her story. And she talks about the power of prayer and how this has really even transformed her family dynamic. Take a look. What does your journey look like today? How are you still surrounded by community? How do you share this light with other people? Yeah, so I mean, uh, it didn't end up being lymphoma, which was amazing. Praise the Lord, Um, yes. Yep, it ended up being histoplasmosis, so it's something that I'm gonna have to live with my whole life. Mm -hmm. Um, I won't know when a flare-up's gonna happen, you Mm -hmm. know, and so I just, I I do what I can, take care of myself. I'm still hyper aware of everything. Um, You know, since then I've had weird things pop up again, and I mean, it's just kind of a cycle, but I mean, now I'm, I put things more out on Facebook now. Right away, I ask for prayers. I don't wait for it to get so bad to where I need the prayers. If it's even something small, I, you know, I put that out there. I think that's something that's really important to think about with, with everybody, no matter how big or how small it is, let people know Mm -hmm. you don't want to fight it alone. And, and that's, it's brought me and my family closer together because, you know, we, we talk about the hard things. We talk about the real things. I mean, I laugh that I have bad genetics. My husband's got great genetics. <laughs> yes. I have terrible genetics. And, you know, so we, we have those hard talks of, yeah. you know, I could be removed from this earth sooner than any of us want. Mm. But just remember, like, we, we know where we're going. Mm-hmm. And, you know, at, at that point, it's, you know, to have those real conversations with your kids is never yeah. easy. But being at hope, being around the people that we're at has made it easier to have those conversations. Mm-hmm. So I would say our relationships are so much stronger because of what we've been through. Mm-hmm. Um, the kids see the world in a new light. Yeah. You know, they, they know that one day everything can be great. Mm-hmm. And the next day you can just feel like things are crashing down. Mm-hmm. But at the end of it all, what we do is we pray together. Yeah. Yeah. You have a new perspective. Yeah. An eternal perspective. 100. Yeah. Anything else about your story, your journey, what would you say to people who are walking through hard things? that are in the midst of the suffering, the trial, mm-hmm. they're not quite seeing healing, mm-hmm. what, what would you say? Don't stay silent, mm. you know, find, find somebody that you trust or reach out to people, um, you know, if you can't pray for yourself because you're angry or whatever, yes. reach out to others, yeah. you know, let them pray for you because you will find, you know, some sort of calm and peace. I'm, I can almost guarantee it. And, mm-hmm. you know, it'll be sometimes unexplainable, like yeah. why all of a sudden, do I feel like this? And, and I think it's because you have a community of people around you who want to be there for you, who want to help you fight. I love hearing about how this has transformed her family, that they pray together. They've had real honest, hard conversations, and now they pray together. They turn to God. They want God to encounter them in prayer. And so I want you to know God wants to encounter you. He's invitational. He loves you. Certainly he wants to encounter you in this community. He's here all the time. But also, I'd like to invite Eric Wickland, he is our volunteer prayer team leader on stage, to talk to you about prayer, because prayer is a very real way that we are in relationship with God and we encounter him. And so Eric not only has a really cool healing story that he's going to share with you, but he's also going to talk about the prayer team and all the cool things happening there. So here you are, Eric. Thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk to you guys today. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a dad. I have two awesome kids. I have a daughter who's 25 and a son who's going to turn 23 next month. Uh, I work for the Department of Natural Resources. I've been there for almost 30 years, which is pretty crazy 
uh, to, to understand. And I know you're all thinking, now how can somebody as young as you have a 30-year career with the state of <laughs> Iowa? Some things we just can't explain. Uh, I've been living in Ankeny here for about 12 years, coming to Hope for about five, and currently serving as the, uh, on, on the prayer team. So to, to open up my story about um, how prayers really changed my life, the thing that you need to know is that uh, about 23 years ago, I had an encounter with God that was pretty incredible. I was driving down here, State 35, heading towards a very scary situation. And I had what can only be described as a physical encounter with God. And after that event, there was no more denying the existence of God for me. He was very real. I was all in. That was the end of it right there. Shortly after that, I kind of accidentally joined the prayer team at the church I was attending in the town I was living in at that time. I had simply asked the pastor a question about what is this prayer ministry about. It's like the uh, prayer partners that we have up here. We can go up and receive prayer. And somehow I ended up at the meeting that next week and I ended up joining the prayer team. And that wasn't my plan at all, but it was kind of a happy accident uh, because that really helped um, develop my passion for prayer and engage me in God with God at even a greater level. So fast forward about six months and uh, <clears throat> had another encounter with God through prayer that was pretty incredible. So I'd had asthma my whole life, and it had progressively gotten worse over time. It had gotten to a point where I was using that uh, many times a day, using the inhaler to get through. And I was pretty scared about that, and there wasn't, uh, it wasn't getting better. So finally one day I went up for prayer, and all my friends were up there, and they said, Eric, what's going on? And I said, well, here's the deal. My asthma's getting worse. I'm burning through an inhaler every 30 days. I'm scared, and I just don't want to deal with this anymore. And they said, okay. So they laid hands on me and they prayed over me. And I remember very distinctly my friend Sue leaning down and saying, Eric, God is healing you right now. And I could feel this warmth in my lungs that I had never experienced before. And I was healed from that moment forth. It was a pretty incredible experience. Now, if God hadn't gotten my attention six months earlier, he certainly reaffirmed it there by establishing that he is a God who heals and he is a very real entity. So what I want to talk to you about today is, is prayer here at Hope. And I want you to know that there is a God, a very real God, and he is pursuing you, and he wants to engage you in prayer. He wants to take you deeper in relationship with him, and one of the, days, one of the ways that he does that is through prayer. Now, there are a lot of things that we as Christians can be called to, but not all of us are called to. Not everyone is called to seminary to become a pastor. Not everyone is called to be on a worship team. Not everyone is called to jump on a plane and head to a foreign country to be a missionary. Those are all great things, and thank you to the people who answer those calls. Prayer is truly something that is for each and every one of us. It's the primary way that God engages us, draws us near to him, and we encounter him. So prayer is not scary. It should not be anything that's intimidating because it's really just a conversation with God. And the only thing that you really bring to prayer is time. You're here today because you've set aside time to encounter God and you're encountering God right now in this uh, community, in this worship. The time that you give to God is the time that you give and how he uses it is really up to him. And that's the one thing that you have to bring. Now I'm going to, uh, I'm going to say a sentence that you will never hear uttered in the English language. Okay, you ready guys? I should have never built the garage that big. Okay? <laughs> Nobody ever says that. The opposite is true. Years ago my parents built a garage and at the last minute my dad called the contractor and said, add another two feet. And he did. And after it was done, my dad just shook his head and said, I should have said four. So your garage can never be too big. The other thing you'll never hear spoken in the English language, man, I really regret drawing closer to God. I'm really disappointed that I engaged God in prayer. Nobody says that, because that's not how it is. God wants to engage with you. He's ready to engage with you. Now, if you're feeling a little bit of guilt out there or you're confused and you're like, well, I'm not having this experience, this is not about guilt. Our God is not a coercive God. He's not trying to trick you into anything. Our God is an invitational God. He is a welcoming God. And he is inviting you into a greater, deeper relationship with him through prayer. I want you to know that, that that is the invitation from him. 
And you may be thinking, well, that's great, Eric. You've got this experience with prayer, but I don't know where to start. Well, good news. My name is Eric. I'm on the prayer team, and I'm here to help. We have resources available for you. We have a prayer team that would love to pray with you. We have a prayer team that meets regularly. You're welcome to come whenever you want and just join with us in prayer. You can just sit there and listen to us. If you would like us to pray for you, we would love to pray for you. Uh, you don't have to join and come every week, although maybe you'll have a happy accident like I did and that'll be where you end up being. The most important thing is that, that we have tools for you. We have a introduction to prayer course coming up in May. It's a very intense 52 week course where you will, <laughs> no, we just meet three times. Three times. Three times, three times for one hour. That's it. Um, and we're not going to make you pray or anything like that. It's just an opportunity to learn more about prayer so we can give you some tools. Because if you, if you don't know how to pray, we can help you do that. And again, it isn't difficult. Uh, there's, no, um, there's no formula to follow. It's really just the time that you give to God one-on-one -on -one to encounter him. So I want to close with the invitation that God is giving to you to encounter him in prayer. We have resources available for you. I'm going to be standing at that table out there outside the door. If you have questions, please come and talk to me. And I want to circle back to the healing that I received 23 years ago. Two things needed to happen for me to receive that. One, I had to ask. Two, people had to pray for me. That was the extent of our responsibility. God does the work. It's not on us to do the work. It's on God to do it. All we have to do is respond to the invitation. Thanks, Eric. Yes, let's give him a round of applause. He's been at every service, yeah, sharing his story with us. That's really what I want you to hear this morning is that the invitation is open to you, whether this is your first visit or you've been here a really long time. You're all invited to experience God's presence because it's real. It's active. The spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And how do we tap into that? Well, certainly in community, but also in prayer. That's your one-on-one -on -one conversation with God. It is impossible to be in relationship with someone and not talk to them. If we are in relationship with God, we have to talk to him. So it's a super unintimidating thing. It's just a conversation. There's no formula. There's no wrong way to pray. You simply start talking to God. And like Eric said, you just bring your time. You bring you into that conversation. You give God time to show up in your life. I love where Eric says, you know, when he prayed, when he asked for prayers for healing, all he did was ask and people prayed. I think one of the misconceptions we have about miracles or God actually doing healing is that it's dependent on my faith. It's dependent on how much I believe God's going to answer that prayer. And that's completely untrue because all of those answers are up to God. That healing is completely up to him. We just ask. And I promise you have nothing to lose by asking. God wants to grant us the desires of our heart. He loves you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you so that death doesn't actually get a say in your life. Jesus defeated that death. There's no grave that's going to hold us down. And so the invitation is yours to accept, to walk into to enjoy being in the presence of God in this community, to lean on people, to ask for prayers, to be bold in those prayers and ask for healing.